Now let's look at how we can actually create the net present value from a stream of future payments. To do this, we just sum the present value of all future payments. For example, here we would take the 100 from this immediate $100 payment. We would take the 9091 from this $100 payment a year from now, and we would take the 8264 from this $100 payment two years from now. And if you do that, you should get about 273.55. So the net present value of this particular future stream of payments is 273.55. If you get a net present value that is greater than zero, we would consider it efficient. It should be pursued. If it is less than zero, the investment is inefficient. It should not be pursued. And if you get a zero, the investment is neutral. It wouldn't matter. You'd be in the same situation after the investment as you were before. It's also worth noting here that in our example, we were only receiving money. The $100 was received right away, a year from now and two years from now. That's not realistic, but of course, that's going to guarantee that all of these present values are positive and that you have an investment that is efficient. If someone's just giving you money or if there's no cost to investing and only a return, then it automatically becomes efficient. Of course, that almost never happens. If you're going to buy stock, for example, you're going to get some future returns, but you're going to have to give up something today. You got to buy the stock. If you're going to go to college, you're going to get some incremental earnings in the future. Returns, but you're going to have to pay for college both directly and indirectly through foregone wages. So when we think about this model a little bit more extensively, we realize that in the real world, some of these are going to be negative. You might have to give up $100 to get this stream of payments, or you might have to pay for a stock, a bond, a college, that would show up in this model as negative. In fact, let's make it a little more realistic. Let's look at Melinda here. She's considering enrolling in a webmaster training program that involves direct costs of 3000 and foregone earnings of 5000 The training program will increase Melinda's earnings by 3000 4000 and 5000 for the three years she plans on working. Let's calculate the net present value. To do this, we use our formula here and find the net, the present value of each of these payments. Okay. And then we add them up. Now, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to switch over to the overhead so we can write this out. I've already got the present value formula replicated here. We're dealing with a 10% uh, discount rate. So this R is going to be 10%. And we need to apply the formula to each of these. Now, you already know that for an immediate payment, this denominator goes to one, which means the present is the future value. An immediate payment is not a future value. So we just write them. So it's going to be negative $8,000. Then for the first year, we're going to need to use this formula. Okay? So we're going to take the present value is going to be equal to 3000 divided by 1.10. And that's going to be taken to the, this is year one. So one year from now is when we're getting that. If you do the math, you should get 2,727. 2,720. I'm just rounding uh, for convenience. Then for the second year, we're going to get 4,000. Again, we divide this by 1.10. In this case, it's going to be to the second, and that should give us 3,306. And then finally, we have 5,000 divided by 1.10 to the third because it's coming in the third year, and that equals 3,757.
2757. Now, in order to get the present value, I'm sorry, we used these, this formula to get the present value for each of these years. So in order to get the net present value, we need to add all of these up. So let me go over here and just write these in. Positive 2727, positive 3306, and positive 3757. If you add all these up, you should get approximately 1790. Okay? So do those computations yourself and see if you get the same numbers. So the last question is, if 1790 is the net present value, then should Melinda embark on this webmaster training program? And the answer is a big yes, because she has a positive net present value, and that means it's an efficient investment. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to our PowerPoint and talk about another method that can be used to determine whether an investment is efficient or inefficient. This is called the internal rate of return method, IRR. The internal rate of return is the discount rate at which the net present value is zero. So really all we're doing is taking that same formula that we had here and setting the present value to zero and then solving for the interest rate that would occur if that happened. Another way of putting it is in this particular uh, model, we're setting net present value at zero and solving for R. Whereas before, we were setting R and solving for net present value. It's really getting you to the same end. It's just through different windows, if you will. When you do this, you're going to get a particular internal rate of return. Now, just to be clear, you're not going to need to do this fancy computation and solve for R. It's a little bit complicated mathematically but we can use Excel or a calculator to get those results. And I'm going to show you in Excel because I think it's um, pretty user friendly. So let's, let's go back to Melinda's situation here using Excel. And I've already populated in Excel the periods and then the different dollar values. All we need to do here is find the internal rate of return function. To do that, you put equal, and then IRR. -R, and it'll pop up there. Then go up to this function menu, click on that, and it'll pull up a drop-down box. And all you have to do is, for values, scroll over all your numbers. And it gives you the answer right there. But you can populate it as well. So it's 21%. Okay. Now we can compare that internal rate of return, R, to our original discount rate, which we're going to identify as I now. If the internal rate of return is greater than the original uh, discount rate, I, the investment is efficient. If, it's, if the internal rate of return is less than I, the investment is inefficient. And if it equals I, we're neutral. Well, we're not surprised to learn that 21% is greater than 10%, so our investment is efficient. The reason we're not surprised is because we already know from the net present value computation that this was a good investment. The internal rate of return will not contradict that. These are just two windows to looking at the same thing. Net present value method, Look for a positive net present value for efficiency or internal rate of return method. Look for a internal rate of return that exceeds the discount rate on that investment. So Melinda should attend college. Now let's look at some of the generalizations that we can make from our human capital model. One is the length of the income stream. 
A longer income stream means that the net present value and the internal rate of return are going to be higher. If we just use the net present, I'm sorry, the internal rate of return method, let me go ahead and just play around with this for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and add another year. I'm going to add year four. And for year four, I'm going to give her, let's say, another $3,000. So she's going to work four years rather than three and get incremental earnings. Now, what will happen to her internal rate of return? It goes to 30%. So when we have a longer period over which to earn income from an investment, that investment becomes more viable. 30% is a better internal rate of return and then 21%. This means that younger people are going to have a higher return than older people when it comes to the college investment. If you're 22 and you're just now finishing college, you might have 40 years of work ahead of you or more. Whereas if you're 52 and you're just finishing college, you might not even have a decade of work ahead of you. It all depends on the individual, but certainly younger people have a longer time frame to earn those incremental returns on that college investment, and thus the net present value and IRR are going to be higher for them. Another one is demographics that exhibit continuity in employment. Traditionally, this was men, but it doesn't have to be. Continuity means uh, staying in the workforce you know, regularly. Women did not have as much continuity as men because of childbirth. And so that would historically bring women out of the workforce two, three, four, five, even more times per year, depending upon the number of children uh, she's passed. Today, with women having less children, the difference between continuity for men and women is becoming less. But obviously, more continu continuity means more earning years and higher net present value and internal rate of return. Another factor that influences uh, the return on the college investment is the cost of attending college. The lower the cost, either direct or indirect, the higher the net present value uh, an internal rate of return. Take a look at our uh, data here again. Now we've got a high internal rate of return. In fact, let's go back to the original example of Melinda, 21%. But let's say that her costs are not 8,000, they're actually 10,000. Could be either the direct costs went up or her foregone earnings during the college program go up. Either way, watch what happens to that internal rate of return. It goes down. The return on college just went lower. The net present value would have went down as well, making college less attractive. So who's going to be most affected by this? Well, if you're younger, your costs of attending college are likely going to be lower than if you're older. And it's not the direct costs that make the difference. A 20-year-old student pays the same tuition as a 50-year-old student. It's the indirect costs that matter. A 20-year-old might be giving up a minimum wage job to go to college, whereas a 50-year-old might be giving up a job they've been doing for 30 years and are earning, you know, $25, $30, $40 an hour. Even. So the opportunity cost of going to college later in life is typically higher, and that's why we see more attendance of college with younger people as opposed to older people. Of course, there are other factors as well. Another thing that comes up with the cost is interest rates, the cost of borrowing. Most people borrow to go to college now, and if interest rates are lower, then it lowers the direct cost and it leads to more college attendance. What has fueled this is low interest rates courtesy of government loan guarantees. If the government guarantees that they will pay the bank back if they make a student loan, then the bank's going to want to make student loans, and they're going to offer better interest rates than otherwise. Also, government subsidize loans through this organization, Sally May. This is a government-sponsored enterprise that buys student loans. Banks, knowing that they can take a student loan and sell it to Sally May, want to make more student loans, and that creates 
lower interest rates in that market and increasing college attendance among the masses.